everybody going to quiet? <laughs> good morning, everybody. Welcome to our worship service. It's good to see you all here. Uh, I don't have a lot of announcements to share this morning, but I do have a couple. Uh, the men's group will meet tonight at 6.30. All men are invited to attend that. Uh, I'm happy to say our air conditioning system is now fully installed. It's going to come in handy in the next couple weeks. So thank you to the uh, building and grounds team for all your help in making that happen. And I'd like to say a special thank you uh, to our hospitality team for all the hard work that they've done uh, since Easter to provide meals for families uh, who have lost loved ones. Uh, they've had quite a few memorial services and families to take care of over the last month or so. Uh, and it always seems like there's nothing like a good hot meal and time spent together to help somebody get through a difficult time. So thank you all for helping to make that possible. Uh, Jessica, do you have an announcement this morning? Yes. I have a couple, so please bear with me. The usual graduation um, insert, if you have a graduate, give it to me, please. Vacation Bible School coming up. We still need a few volunteers, so get your name on the list if you're available. And our young adult for the week is Sarah Campbell. Um, May is Mental Health Month. And so we are going to show a video every Sunday in May to just educate on the matter. Um, most of you know our church offers our community and individuals Christian counseling through Revive Ministry. This is a no-cost ministry but does accept love offerings to offset the cost of supplies and to pull that off. We have been serving for over a year and a half and have had the privilege of serving many thus far. So God is great. God is good. First and foremost, we ask for prayer this month and all year that we can be a part of God's plan to provide health healing for his children's lives in some of their darkest moments. Throughout May and every May, hopefully moving forward, we will show videos in hopes of educating on the different topics of mental health. We will also have counseling, love offering envelopes in the back of the chairs. There are some now, but there will be more. Um, if you do not have one but would still like to make an offering to this particular ministry, be sure to mark the check or envelope that you do use so we can allot it to the right direction. Our hope and prayer is that we can provide this help every year for many years to come. I do want to warn you that some of the videos may, that we mention may have topics that could be unsettling, so just be aware of that. I want to encourage everyone to listen to the signs, the symptoms, and different issues that it does talk about so that you can better see struggling in your own life or those around you because everyone is going through something. Um, many do not seek help or even know an individual is struggling until it is too late. We are called to, by God to love our neighbors and to look after his flock, so we should be paying attention and catching these things so that we can Pray for them or help them when they need it. So let this be one step closer of doing that. Jessica, should we have any sort? Our friend of the week is Roger Rhodes, who is Bella's, uh, Bella Pork's brother. Please remember him this week. Um, information in your bulletin for our ladies for um, our women's conference that's coming up this coming week at um, uh, White Hill Church and um, about our ladies' Bible study that will start in June. And I'll send a reminder to our ringers that we will meet tonight for rehearsal as well as our worship ensemble. And um, with that, Ms. Sawyer is going to lead us into worshiping our God together.
opening hymn of praise is a beautiful hymn entitled At the Name of Jesus, and it comes from the scripture out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, that says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. Would you stand as we sing the first, third, and the fourth stanza?
Our responsive reading for this morning is in your hymnals, number 710. Would you please turn there with me? Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. But the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Our offertory medley, soon and very soon, in a few stanzas of Shall We Gather at the River, I'll invite you to stand as we sing.
give it back to you to, so you can further your kingdom and use us as witnesses to show this community and the world um, the great love that you have for us. We thank you for all that you have done and all that Christ has done for us. Through, through him we have our salvation and it's only through him. And so we are thankful for that. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Steve shares a couple of songs that are actually prayer courses, um, <clears throat> asking the, the Lord to come and the Holy Spirit to come and to meet our needs um, and also to draw us closer to Him.
all couldn't see what was happening back there. Thank you. She was doing a beautiful rendition with her flags. I should have had you come up here. Thank you. short series about the books of heaven, the books in God's personal library. And last week we talked about the Lamb's Book of Life, which is a record of every person's name whose home is in heaven. According to Revelation, that book was created before anything else was created. And that's probably the most important book that God has as far as we're concerned, because if your name is written in that book, your place in eternity is assured your life will not end in this world. It will continue for eternity with Christ uh, in the first heaven and then in the new earth and, and the, new, the new heaven and the new earth. We also talked about how even though that book is for your heavenly home, knowing your name is written there helps get you through your temporary home in this world. But there's another book in God's library that helps you get through this life too. And in the Bible, that book is mentioned by someone who truly understood that this life is wonderful, this life is beautiful, this life is filled with good things, but it's often very painful too. Uh, and I love that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat that. From Genesis straight through Revelation, Scripture speaks to the reality of pain in your life and how to get through your tough times in a way that leaves you stronger and even more faithful. The Bible is very clear on the fact that you need to know how to suffer because suffering is a part of life. Read with me from Psalm 56, beginning with verses 3 and 4 and then continuing from verses 8 to 11. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? This is the word of the Lord. David is the author of of this psalm, and your Bible may have a note at the beginning of this psalm that describes what's happening in David's life when he wrote this. Uh, this is when the Philistines seized him in the city of Gath, and you can read about that later on uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 21. But David is basically a prisoner of war here. He's in the enemy camp, and he is surrounded. There is no way out. And David has come to a point where he thinks... I don't know if I'm going to make it. Now, most of us cannot imagine what it's like to be in David's shoes here. But I can pretty much guarantee you that at some point in your life, you have started wondering if you're going to make it. You've lost a job, and you have a family to support, and you think, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Your doctor sits you down, and he says, I found something. And you think, I might not survive this. You lose someone you love, whether through death or divorce, and you think, I don't know if I can continue on. You do not have to be a prisoner of war to believe that you've run up against something that might do you in. You just have to live long enough in this beautiful but broken world. When something like that happens, you really only have two options, don't you? You can either give up or you can look up. You can either believe that whatever it is that's coming to your life is completely random and it's just a matter of bad luck, that it's just life, or you can believe that for reasons you don't know, God has sent this thing or this circumstance into your life. Those are your only two choices. As a Christian, option one really isn't an option, is it? If your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if, you're, if your Savior is Jesus Christ, then giving up in this life is never a choice. Sometimes the only way out of a bad situation is to go through it. 
And if you are a Christian, you know that nothing is random because God has a purpose for everything. There is no such thing as luck, good or bad, because since God controls everything, and by that I mean everything, there is no such thing as chance. That means as a Christian, the only option you have is the second one. You don't give up, you look up. And that's what David's doing here. This psalm starts off with David talking about how his enemies are trampling on him all day long. They're mocking him. So David has to make a choice. He can't go by what he's feeling. David can't let his emotions drive him here because if he does that, then he's going to sink. Instead, he's driven by his faith. When I'm afraid, he says, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Now, there are a couple things to mention here in these verses. First, what is David doing in these first two verses here, three and four? It actually looks like he's doing two different things here. He's doing one thing in verse three and another in verse four. In verse three, David's praying. He says, I put my trust in you. He's talking to God here, isn't he? And David says that he's going to put his trust in God when I am afraid. Now, there is another way of translating that verse, and it's an interesting one because of this book of God that we're talking about today. Because another way of translating when I am afraid is when I cry. Now, that gets right down into the heart of life, doesn't it? Because notice what verse 3 is saying. It's not saying that we should never be afraid. It's not saying that we should never cry. It's saying that there will absolutely be times when you will be scared out of your mind. There will absolutely be times when the only thing you can do is break down and cry. But David says when those times come, the one thing that you have to make sure that you do, the most important thing is to put your trust in God. Not faith. Notice that. David says trust. There's a difference. When David says, I will put my trust in you, he's talking about the security that comes when you have somebody you can completely confide in and be confident in. Someone who will never fail you. Someone who will never let you down. The Hebrew meaning of that word is to cling to something with a tight grip. And sometimes we struggle with that, don't we? Because all of us have relationships with people that we trust. And we have all been hurt by those relationships. Even the people that we love the most in this world will hurt us. If only unintentionally. Even the people we trust the most will sometimes let us down. And the temptation we all face there is to see our relationship with God in the same way that we see our relationship with with these other people that we love. Meaning that sometimes we can act a little guarded. We can hold some things back from God. But the trust that David is talking about is complete and total trust in somebody who will never let him down because that someone is a perfectly loving God. It's a trust that's not based on a wish that God's going to help him. It's a complete expectation that God will help him because that's who God is. God helps those whom he loves. That means David, no matter how bad his situation looked. And that means you, no matter how bad your situation looks. David is, is he's in some seriously bad trouble here. But he is still absolutely free in the sense that he can choose whether to give up or look up. He can give in to his fear and his worry about his enemies trampling on him day after day. Or he can trust that God will use this situation to make David more like the person God wants him to be. And listen to me. It does not matter whether your own terrible situation is something bad that you've done or something bad that's been done to you. It doesn't matter if your suffering is the result of a stupid decision you've made or cancer. God can use both. To bring you closer to him, but you have to trust him. David's a perfect example of this right here. Because this mess that David's in is his own fault. David's made a bad choice here. He's running from King Saul, 
But David decides to run right to the Philistines. And they hate him as much as Saul does. And to make things worse, David runs to the city of Gath. Well, guess who had been born and raised in Gath? Goliath. The giant David killed. David's not making very good choices here, is he? But there is nothing in your life, including your bad choices, that God cannot use to bring, him, bring you closer to him. Including even your bad choices. So David starts off in verse 3 by praying. But now in verse 4, there's a little shift. David starts talking to himself. In verse 3, he's talking to God. And so he uses the word you. I will put my trust in you. He's talking to God. But in verse 4, David is thinking about God, which is why he uses God's name. In God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And we're going to see this again in a little bit. David talking to himself. We, we always hear about how important it is to talk to God. In fact, that's the most important thing you can do. But right under that is talking to yourself. Having that little conversation with yourself that says, okay, now things aren't going great here. I'm, I'm feeling mad. I'm feeling hurt. I'm, I'm feeling afraid. But now how does God say that I should respond to this? What does God say I should do? Having those little conversations with yourself can keep you out of a world of trouble. And it also helps tamp down whatever emotion that you're feeling in the moment. In these first three verses of Psalm 56, David is feeling all kinds of bad emotions. He's afraid. He's worried. He's feeling like this is the end. So how in the world can David turn around just one verse later, in verse 4, with an attitude of praise? Well, David can praise God because he's just made the choice to trust God. True praise always follows true trust. And what specifically is David praising here? He's praising God's word. Now, there is no limit to the things about God that we can praise. We praise his goodness when we're blessed. We praise his protection when we're saved from something. We praise his faithfulness when we, when we feel that divine forgiveness of a sin. But when your life gets turned upside down and you catch yourself starting to think, I might not get through this, what you praise is God's word. What you praise are those promises that God makes to you and cannot be broken. But in order to know those promises, you have got to keep your nose in your Bible. You can't lean on promises that you don't know, right? And then David repeats to himself what he's just said to God. And God, I trust, he says, I shall not be afraid. David says in every danger, in every trouble, in every circumstance, no matter how things look or how they feel, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much I suffer, no matter what I feel, I will trust in you, God. That is true faith. And that is exactly why the only name mentioned more often than David's in the entire Bible is Jesus Christ. David wasn't a superman. He wasn't special. He was a shepherd. He didn't have any special spiritual gift. Which means that the faith he had in God and the trust that he was able to have in his Lord is the same amount as you can have. And when you have that kind of faith and trust in God, what you come to realize is exactly what David realizes at the end of verse 4. If God is with you, what can anything else do to you? Can anything overcome you? No. Can anything hurt you? No, not in the sense that even the things that hurt you end up helping you. God works all things together for good for those who love him, right? So anything that comes into your life, no matter how tough and hard it is, is something that in the end will be so much for your good that you're actually going to thank him for. In fact, and we've said this before, if you knew everything that God knows, you'd be on your knees begging him to give you exactly what is in your life right now. That is what real godly trust is. It doesn't matter what flesh does to you, meaning other people. It doesn't matter what your own body does to you. It doesn't matter what the world does to you. Every scheme, every weapon, every attempt the world makes against you will fail unless God allows it. And if God allows it, then it is only for your own good. If God is your God... If your complete trust is in him to lead and guide you the way he sees fit, then there is not a single thing in your life that you need to be afraid of. That's what Jesus says. 
Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, if your life is right with God, this world can't touch you. The worst thing this world can do is kill you. But that just turns out to be your biggest blessing because that's what sends you to heaven. Amen. Everything has a purpose. It's all for a reason. And you might not know that reason now. And you might not ever know that reason until you stand before God. But there is a reason. And even if you can't know what that reason is, knowing God has one can help get you through. And how do you know that God has a purpose for everything you go through? Because he says he does. Look how verse 8 begins. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Now, what I want you to pay attention to here is that this is, this is one sentence, right, with a semicolon in the middle. It's two thoughts linked together. And the words that are linked there are tossings and tears. Now, I'm using the ESV translation. Other translations use wanderings in place of tossings. I think the NIV uses the word misery there. It's a tough word in Hebrew to translate, but the link between tossing and tears means that David is talking about mental anguish. He's not just talking about what he's going through. He's also talking about all the terrible thoughts and feelings he's having while he's going through it. Have you ever had a time in your life when you were going through something so terrible and so painful that you know the only thing you can do is pray? But then when you try to pray, nothing comes out. You're hurting so badly that you can't even express to God in words what you're feeling. But God says, I see that. I hear that. Every word you cannot speak is a word I know and understand. And I mark down every one. God keeps our tears in a bottle. He marks down every one. But where does he keep a record of those tears? Where does God write down every one of our mental and emotional tossings? David tells us at the end of verse 8, are they not in your book? God not only keeps a book that has all the names of everyone who will ever call heaven home, he also keeps a book that includes every moment that you didn't think you'd make it through. And every time worry and fear and doubt crushed you. It includes the words of every wordless prayer you ever tried to pray. And why is that book of tears so important? Why is your name and those pages upon pages of pains and hurts so special? Because it means that God doesn't just take note of your suffering. God treasures your suffering. Which means that not a single moment of hurt is without a purpose. God sees it, God knows it, and God will account for every single bit of it in the end. God has a bottle and a book for his people's tears. Tears for your sins and tears for your afflictions. He sees every one of them with compassion and concern. He hurts when you hurt because you are his precious child. And if you are precious in his sight, how much more precious are the tears that you shed? Those tears are so valuable that they're sealed up and they're stored among God's treasures. And those, those tears aren't kept as ornaments. Right? They're not filed away and forgotten. They are stored in heaven for God's divine action. Your part of the book of tears will be reviewed at the last judgment. And every wrong that you ever suffered in life is going to be made right. Every hurt is going to be transformed into laughter. The lower that you are laid in this world, the higher God will raise you up in heaven. What you sow in tears now will be reaped in joy then. That is the promise verse 8 makes to you. God says not a single tear you ever shed falls to the ground. He collects every one because one day he will account for every one. He will wipe those tears away. But God never takes anything away without replacing it with something better. He keeps track of them all because even your tears serve God's purposes. They're all appointed by him. Their measure, their duration, their quantity, how long they're going to last, because it's all done in love. And I know it doesn't seem like love when you're going through it. It doesn't look like love, and it sure doesn't feel like love. But remember where David's coming from here. He is able to understand that God's love is behind even this situation. 
Because David has already said that no matter what he feels, no matter what he thinks, no matter what he's going through, he is going to trust God. That trust is the foundation of everything. That trust might not fix your circumstances, but it will absolutely fix your attitude in those circumstances. Now, this psalm is divided into two parts. It starts out with David describing all of his fears about this horrible situation he's in. That's verses 1 through 7. And then the psalm ends with verses 9 through 13, and David talking about the hope that he feels and the confidence he has. The hinge to this psalm, the, the thing that turns David from fear to confidence is verse 8. It's remembering that God is keeping track of every moment of his life, and God is in control of it all. And when you have that trust and you make the decision that every one of your tears serves God's purposes, what else can you conclude about any situation in your life other than what David concludes in verse 9? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. And here's where we get right to the heart of what it means to be a Christian. <clears throat> this is where the line is drawn between people who call themselves believers and people who actually live a believer's life. Do you know that God is for you? Do you believe that he is working on your behalf and for your good? Because if you believe in your heart that God is on your side and that he is working for you, then there is absolutely no enemy in your life that can overcome you or your faith. Not a person, not a situation, not an illness, not even a death. If you know that God is for you, then surely, surely, nothing can be against you. This is the foundation of David's hope and deliverance. And it is yours too. Because whether you realize it or not, God has been for you countless times. More times than you can, ever, than you can even think of. And I know that's true because you're sitting here right now, aren't you? You're here. You're alive. He is for you with all the infinity of his being, with every ounce of his love, with all the perfection of his wisdom. He is eternally for you. Amen. And you have to be like David. He doesn't say, well, I feel like God's for me. I, I, I guess God's for me. No, this I know that God is for me. David knows it in his bones. His trust in God leaves absolutely no doubt that God is for him. And you know what that means? It means the king of kings is on your side. The Lord of lords is working everything in your life for good. How safe are you with a protector like that? How sure, that you, how sure can you be that everything, everything, will turn out to be a blessing if you know that the God who loves you is behind it all with his protection and his wisdom. When you have no strength left to fight, when you have no tears left to shed, when it feels like the world is crashing down all around you, all you need to overthrow your enemies is to pray. That is why even when things seem at their worst, you can do what David does in verse 10. You can praise. You can praise God for what he's doing in your life even if it feels terrible. Even if you can't see it. You can praise God for his love even if your heart can't feel it because it's so broken. And no matter what, you can praise God for his word because God's words convey God's promises. And God cannot break his promises. Amen? Amen. But it takes work to get to that point. We talked a minute ago about the division of people between you know, the ones who call themselves believers and the ones who actually live a believer's life. There's actually a name now for Christians who call themselves believers but act like they don't believe at all. They're actually called cultural Christians. They're the ones who might have been raised in a Christian home, but, but their own homes as adults aren't Christian homes. Or maybe they went to church when they were kids, but they don't anymore. Or maybe they have a Bible on their coffee table, but it has a, a, like an inch of dust on it because it hasn't been opened in years. They call themselves Christians, but they don't live the Christian life. And these are the people who will stand before Christ and hear him say, I never knew you. There is no middle ground when it comes to your faith. You either give all of your life to Christ or you give none of them. You either devote your life to him or you live for yourself. And we're going to talk about this next week. It doesn't matter what you say you believe. What matters is that you live out what you believe. And that takes work. 
Every day of your life. It takes prayer. It takes reading your Bible to hear those promises of God. It takes becoming more like Jesus and less like you. And it takes over and over again what David does in verses 9 through 11. Because in verses 9 through 11, David's talking to himself again, isn't he? Verse 11 is actually stating the same thing as verse 4. David's repeating it. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Over and over again, talking to himself, asking the question that matters most. And that question is, what do I believe? When was the last time you asked yourself that question? When was the last time you took a pen and a piece of paper and you wrote down the number one and you went from there to number 10 or 20 or 100 and you wrote down exactly what you believe? You absolutely need to do that. You have to get it straight in your mind and in your heart, what you know to be true about God. And then you have to do it again and again and again. Because when you enter into one of those seasons in your life when everything turns bad, all that work you did on your soul is going to pay off. Because you're going to have a faith that won't break. That's what happens to David in Psalm 56. That's how he can start off in verse 1 afraid that everything is lost. And then end in verse 13 by saying, even though he's still in the middle of all that darkness, God's already rescued him. That's how he can know that every tear, every tear he sheds is being recorded. And every tear will be accounted for. And every tear will one day be changed to joy. You believe that? Say amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, you've told us that in this world we will have many troubles. But we should always take heart because you have overcome the world. Truly, there is no enemy that can stand against us because you are for us. And so we pray for the strength to continue on when we feel we cannot. We pray for the faith to continue believing when we want to doubt. We pray for the hope of your great promise that you will work all things for good because we love you and we are called by your precious name. And it's in that name that we ask these things. Amen. I have a response as tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Would you please stand and sing? <laughs> keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.